Ahoy hoy, I'm Planner Walk. So, sports has now gone woke. The woke mob. They've been trying to make sports political for years, and they finally did it. Out of all the things to make political, why would you make sports political? It's just people having fun. That's all it is. Maybe it's just that the left doesn't want people to have fun. That's why they made video games political. So when did the woke mob finally infiltrate sports and make it political? Well, that was a few years ago in... 1981. The tour is still on and we've come back again to say once again that we don't want that tour to happen because we oppose apartheid, we oppose the injustice and bondage of that system. In Wellington tonight, an estimated 15,000 people took to the streets to protest against the Springbok tour. Okay, so first things first, the events that I'm going to be talking about in this video did actually happen. If you are from New Zealand, you might be familiar with these events. They were certainly controversial, but one of the interesting things that I've found is that there are certain parallels between how we talk about politics and media today and this event. But on the flip side, there are also certain differences because the internet has changed how we think. So that is another thing that we'll be looking at today and we'll be poking fun at it as well. So the event was the 1981 Springboks tour. This was a tour that happened in New Zealand and sparked nationwide protests. These protests started out pretty peaceful, but like any protests, violence did end up occurring. You see, the woke BLM and Tifa activists started rioting. Windows were shattered, there were fires that were lit, objects were being thrown at police, there was even a bomb that was detonated. And this was all because the snowflakes on the radical left couldn't handle the fact that the Prime Minister at the time, Robert Muldoon, did not want to inject politics into sports. The curious thing though is that it wasn't necessarily the protesters that made it political. Of course, it's easy to point to protesters that are protesting against sports on political grounds and say, well, sports shouldn't be political and you're trying to make it political by protesting against it. However, like always, this ignores historical context. So let's wind the clock back a bit and explain how we got to that point. So South Africa throughout the 1900s was quite racist, it turns out. Even though 1948 was when apartheid began in South Africa, there was still quite a bit of racism there before then. Now, New Zealand, on the other hand, isn't quite as racist, even if there is still racism here. And combine that with the fact that rugby is kind of a big thing here in New Zealand, we don't really care, for the most part, who is on our rugby team. We do sometimes, but we'll get to that. So naturally, this means that our rugby team has always had diversity. It has had white people, it has had Māori people, it has had Samoan people even. And we cheer them on regardless of which skin colour they happen to have. Now some people from South Africa weren't too happy with that. Notably, in 1921, there was a South African journalist who wrote, Bad enough having to play officially designated New Zealand natives, but spectacle thousands of Europeans frantically cheering on bands of coloured men to defeat members of their own race was too much for Springboks who were frankly disgusted. So racist people were being snowflakes. Who would have thought? Yeah, but that's not really politics in sports though. That's just a racist person writing how they don't like Māori people in sports. Well, you see, the game that was being talked about there was actually a game that happened in New Zealand. In later years, there were games that were played in South Africa with notable differences. The differences being that there were no Māoris on the team, and this was because of South Africa's segregation laws. This continued for a while until 1960, when New Zealanders decided, you know what, if Māoris aren't allowed on the team when they go to South Africa, then there'll be no tour. And there was even a petition that garnered 150,000 signatures. And seeing as change.org didn't exist at the time, that's a lot of people signing a petition. And due to that petition having so many signatures, the tour went ahead anyway, it didn't really stop that one. Then four years later in 1964, Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for opposing apartheid. Doesn't really have much to do with the story, but I thought I'd mention it. Now there was a tour that was proposed in 1967, but that was cancelled due to the fact that, you know, New Zealanders kind of didn't like racism. 
But in 1968, the woke mob from the UN decided that no one should play sports with South Africa anymore. You know, that's literally 1984 right there. Now sure, it wasn't something that the UN really could enforce, but calling for a sports boycott because of a country's politics is pretty Orwellian. Just keep politics out of sports. The following year, there was a group set up in New Zealand called HEART, standing for Halt All Racist Tours. And there are no prizes for guessing what they are all about. One of the interesting things that I found out about this group is apparently Tim Shadbolt was a co-founder. And for those that don't know, Tim Shadbolt is a bit of a meme in New Zealand. Given the fact that he is a radical leftist with a concrete mixer, I mean, you cannot make this up. He has a concrete mixer which he called Karl Marx. And after winning an election, he towed it through the city. This was a local election, by the way. I'm not sure if he still has that concrete mixer, though. Now, despite the UN calling for boycotts and Hart not wanting the tour to go ahead, in 1970, the All Blacks toured South Africa again. But this time, there was a difference. You see, this time, New Zealand actually sent a team with Maldives in it. But this was only because the South African government allowed the Maldives to travel as honorary whites. I'm not sure what the response from the international community was, but that doesn't really solve the apartheid issue, does it? And that is why there was controversy leading up to the 1973 Springbok tour that was scheduled. In fact, in 1972, when running for Prime Minister, Labour leader Norman Kirk promised that he would not interfere with the tour. However, those are the lies that you'd expect from a typical Liberal politician because he did ask the New Zealand Rugby Football Union to withdraw its invitation to the Springboks. And because that didn't work, in 1973, the woke Antifa activists burnt down a grandstand in Papakura. Um, just so you know, it's actually pronounced Papakura. Anyway, what ended up happening is the tour got postponed, and there were actually people that claimed that Norman Kirk had bowed to rent a mob activists. And that actually sounds similar to what people say these days about BLM protests. Because there are people that claim that BLM protesters are all getting paid by George Soros or something like that. It also sounds vaguely reminiscent to me of the whole woke mob will cancel you kind of rhetoric that we hear all the time. This of course ignores the fact that right around the corner in 1974, there were the Commonwealth Games in Christchurch. Christchurch was even building a brand new stadium for these games called QE2. That stands for Queen Elizabeth II. Now it seems unlikely that these games would have been cancelled or anything. However, if the 1973 Springbok tour had have proceeded, then some of the African nations may have boycotted it. So politically, it makes a lot more sense to just not have the Springbok tour. However, this may have hurt Norman Kirk in the polls because in 1975, he lost the election to Robert Muldoon. Now, Robert Muldoon was definitely a keep politics out of sports kind of person, which meant that matches between the All Blacks and the Springboks were back on the menu. So in 1976, the All Blacks went to South Africa and did a tour there. And needless to say, the world didn't like that. You see, apartheid was still going on at that time, and most of the world had realised that it was bad, and so decided, you know what we were going to do? We're just not going to play any sports with South Africa anymore. But New Zealand decided to do so anyway, and in doing so, we kind of damaged our reputation on the world stage. But in 1977, there was this thing called the Glen Eagles Agreement, which said that everyone in the Commonwealth will basically avoid having sporting events with South Africa. Now, given that we're not at 1981 yet, you can take a guess at how that went. So despite the Glen Eagles Agreement, Robert Muldoon maintained that politics should have no place in sports. And so in 1980, the Springboks were invited over to New Zealand in 1981. Now, I find it kind of weird how people were saying that politics should have no place in sports. However, politics was having an impact on sports. Sure, given the fact that they were being treated as honorary whites when they went over to South Africa, Maldives were allowed to play on the All Blacks team when in South Africa now. However, the Springboks team was kind of decided by the politics of South Africa. Like, if we're going to say that politics should have no place in sports, shouldn't we be condemning South Africa for putting politics into sports? Anyway, given all that, the stage was set for 1981. And... They knew that it was going to be a big controversy here in New Zealand. Obviously, Hart were staunchly opposed to this tour, given the fact that their whole thing was, you know, opposing these tours. Makes sense. The people at Hart were anti-New Zealand, though. They were spreading fake news about New Zealand. 
Robert Muldoon wouldn't lie about that, would he? Would you look at that? Turns out that having conspiracy theorists in places of power talking about fake news isn't anything new. The main difference is that back then it wasn't called fake news, it was just called lies. So simpler times. Anyway, on July 22nd, 1981, the first game, and thus the first protest, happened. Now before the game, the Antifa activists broke into the stadium and littered broken glass all over the field. I mean, that's vandalism right there! Now I believe the people that did that were arrested and it didn't deter the game from happening even with the protests going on outside. But the next game was cancelled by the woke mob as they all went onto the pitch to stop the game from happening. Now the reason why the match was cancelled was actually due to security reasons because there were a lot of protesters that had broken in and were on the pitch. But then there was also the rugby crowd and fights had started between protesters and the rugby crowd. There were quite a few objects that were thrown at the protesters and after the match was cancelled there were chants of we want rugby, we want rugby. Now the third protest is where things got really violent. Although not at the location of the game, this was actually in Wellington. Protesters were intending to march up Molesworth Street and the police told them that they weren't allowed to do that. The protesters marched anyway despite orders to stop and well, the protesters were unarmed and the police had batons. You can guess what's going to happen next. Well, very one-sided violence broke out, that's what happened next. And funnily enough, after the protest, some of the protesters actually went to the police station to lay charges for assault. After that protest, the protesters made sure to wear protective headgear in order to keep their noggin safe. Now despite all the carnage happening outside of Parliament, Robert Muldoon wasn't actually there. He wasn't actually in New Zealand. He was actually over in London. This was for the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana, so don't worry, he wasn't taking a holiday whilst a crisis was unfolding. He's not Scott Morrison. Now I'm not going to go over every single protest that happened because there were a lot of games and therefore a lot of protests. There was another game that was cancelled in Timaru and once again it was cancelled for security reasons. But I do want to talk about one more protest and that was the protest that happened during the last game of the tour. You see, BLM and Tifa protesters were being violent on the streets towards police and during the game, a radical Marxist by the name of Marx Jones that was actually his name by the way flew a plane and dropped flares and flower bombs onto the pitch. Now if you're anything like me when I was talking to my granddad about this you're probably wondering what is a flower bomb? Well, it's flour. Now obviously there's a big difference given that I just use a handful of flour and the flour bombs that were dropped on the pitches were, you know, bags of flour and the only mice that they would have dropped on on the pitches would have been field mice, not electronic mice. But I thought that was pretty wild when I heard about that happening. Obviously it was a protester that did that and the game still continued. So as you can probably tell, it was a pretty significant event that happened in New Zealand history. Especially given that polling data showed that opposition to the tour was at 54%. That meant 54% of New Zealanders were opposed to the tour going ahead. Despite such fierce opposition though, Robert Muldoon still won a third term in Parliament. Hey, but didn't Norman Kirk get booted out of Parliament because he postponed the tour? Go woke, go broke, I guess. Well, the thing that Norman Kirk was specifically trying to avoid by postponing the tour, well, it happened anyway because of Robert Muldoon. Interestingly, Nelson Mandela, whilst in prison, heard about the protests and specifically heard about one of the games getting cancelled. Needless to say, it made his day. Now there is one thing that I have to mention because I did talk a lot about the violence that happened in the protests. Kind of like how any protest that happens today, we generally tend to focus on the violence that happens. And that is because peaceful protest happens doesn't really catch headlines as much as violent looters riot in the streets. You see this quite often with the BLM protests. You say, well most BLM protests were peaceful and then immediately there will be people that will go, no they weren't, you're just wrong about that. This is because more often than not, it is the protests that turn violent that make headlines. So you really get to see any of the peaceful ones. And if the news source that you're listening to wants to paint the protests in a bad light, well, they're only going to show you the worst parts of them. My point being is that just because you are shown all the bad parts of a protest, 
don't assume that that means that the majority of protests were that way. Now I haven't gone ahead and checked all the protests myself, but given the fact that there were protests happening throughout the country for each game, I'd be willing to bet that most of the protests would have been peaceful in the 1981 Springboks tour. It's undeniable that there was some violence during the protests, and you can ask the question of was the violence justified? And that is a good question to ask. There may be some people in my audience that were at the protests, and it would be interesting to see what their perspective on it is. So that's what the comment section is for. But lastly, I want to bring it back to the thesis of this video in a way, and that is politics in sports. Now, in an ideal world, it would be great if we could just have no politics in sports whatsoever. However, given the fact that political issues get brought up in sports, all the time, I don't think that that's really an option. Regardless of whether it's a hundred years ago or even 2022, there is going to be politics in sports to some extent. Despite Robert Muldoon not wanting to mix politics and sports, at the end of the day, the South African team, the Springboks, were a result of politics. And I find that today, a lot of people have aversion to seeing things like politics in media. Now I get it, it can be annoying to see politics in media, but what's often overlooked is when politics is in media, but we don't call it politics. A good example of this is characters that are meant to be queer, but they can't be made queer because of political interests. And I think that's because when people don't directly see the politics involved, they don't think of it as political. When a rugby team that is a product of apartheid tours, well, we don't directly see the politics that are involved there so we don't label it as political. But God forbid anyone pointing out that, because if you do, then you're the one that's making it political. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let's put my hair down because I don't want to keep this hair tie in, and I know that people are annoyed when I... I don't really do this often, but I'm doing this because I felt like it suited the look for this v particular video. So there we go. The hair is back. But yeah, leave a like and subscribe and share this video if you enjoyed it. This was mostly a history video, but I decided to tackle it from a different angle rather than just, you know, recount history like most people do. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.